so folks, sorry that we are getting started a little late, but I really appreciate all of your being here. And we have another, uh, another great panel for you uh, and a chance to learn uh, about a lot of different organizations and companies and opportunities. So to start off this big picture panel, we are going to first hear from Ruth McCormick, who is the Director for Federal and State Affairs with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. And I'm very proud to say that I've worked with the Business Council for years and years and years. And uh, so we're delighted to have you kick us off, Ruth. OK, great. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I have to say how awesome it is to see a full room, especially at 1230 during the lunch hour. So thanks for spending your lunch time with us. Uh, as Carol said, my name is Ruth McCormick, and I am the Director of Federal and State Affairs for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, which is a coalition of both trade associations and businesses from the renewable energy, energy efficiency, and natural gas sectors. So I get the opportunity to describe for you the big picture, what's happening here in the United States with sustainable energy. And to do that, I've broken really it down into five major points, what, which I think describe the big picture. And one is, first, that we as a nation are becoming much more energy productive. We're getting more bang for the buck out of our energy. Number two, renewables are expanding. Number three, we're doing all of this and prices are remaining low. Four, consumers want it. They want to use cleaner energy and they want to be more energy efficient. And number five, all of these describe structural changes that are happening that are here to stay, that aren't just a one-off time happen, uh, but things are here to stay. And I make these points based on a report that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy released earlier this year in conjunction with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the market analysts. It's called the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. This is our six, 2016 edition, and it's about the fourth year in a row that we've produced this report. And there's a lot of really good factual information in here about these structural changes that are happening with the United States. So to just give you some of the stats to back up the points that I've made, the report shows that with respect to energy productivity, that since 2007, our economy has grown by 10%, but our energy consumption has declined by 2.4%. So that shows how we're becoming much more energy productive with the energy that we use. And with re respect to renewables, renewables now represent 20% of our electric generation fleet. And that comes from a wide variety of renewable energy sources. And I know some of our panelists are going to get a little bit more deep into those technologies. But they have had great years. Um, the wind and solar industry in particular have had great years in the past year. Their um, generation has increased significantly. And we still have other sources of renewable energy, such as hydropower, biogas, biomass, fuel cells, um, and others that are making a contribution to our increased use of renewables in the United States. Prices have remained low. These changes are occurring at the same time that prices for electricity are 5.8% lower than they were at their peak at 2008. So despite the, the fears that prices would increase with the increased use of renewables, that's not happening. We're seeing that prices have gone down dramatically. A lot of this is um, the result of the low natural gas prices, but it's also a significant decline in the price for renewable energy technologies. With respect to the point on consumers' demand for these technologies, um, in 2015, corporations consumed 3.1 gigawatts of new renewable capacity. So they're demanding these cleaner sources of energy, which is helping to drive the demand in other sectors of the economy. These are structural changes that Bloomberg New Energy Finance says are here to stay. And this is largely because of policies that have been in place, put in place, things such as the Clean Power Plan, uh, 
the Paris Agreement, the international agreement, and also multi-year tax extensions that were enacted at the end of last year. There's a lot more to be done to increase this positive growth that we're seeing, but this uh, is helping to set the stage for a transformation in the energy sector here in the United States, which we think is positive and will be here for a while to come. Thanks very much, Ruth. And now we will turn to Jack Tiroff, who is the head of regulatory affairs with Inel Green Power North America. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and I will start by giving a, uh, another plug and endorsement to the Business Council's uh, Factbook. Uh, it's a fantastic resource. And when we're talking about the big picture, because it's done every year, um, you're able to see really how these industries are, are changing. So I am a, I'm a big fan of that book and would encourage everybody here, if you haven't read it, if you haven't downloaded it, um, please do so. Um, so like Ruth, I'm going to go through uh, six points instead of five. Um, and let me first just introduce who we are as a company. Uh, and now Green Power North America is a, a renewable independent power producer. Uh, we're present in 22 states. We have about 100 power plants. Um, totally about 2,500 megawatts. Uh, we have 750 megawatts under construction now. Uh, we're unique in this marketplace because uh, we don't just do one technology. Uh, we're a wind company, we do geothermal, we do solar, we do hydropower. Um, and so our portfolio includes uh, big, beautiful wind farms in Kansas and Oklahoma, uh, geothermal in uh, Utah and Nevada, um, old mill sites that have been converted uh, into hydropower facilities in the northeast and the southeast. Uh, and we're uh, currently building 100 megawatts of solar in Minnesota, uh, spread out across 16 sites. And I could go on and on about how fantastic each of those plants uh, is, but I would invite you to, to uh, visit our booth, uh, which is um, just down the hall, and uh, pick up some information, uh, talk to a couple of our, our folks who are there uh, to learn more about us. So let me drill down a little bit on uh, the renewable energy sector specifically, um, big picture, what's happening. Uh, Ruth, to, to build off of what you had said, there has been absolutely tremendous growth uh, in this industry. Um, I can remember, I think the first expo I came to was 2009, um, and the progress that has been made for renewables is just um, absolutely striking, absolutely incredible. Uh, last year, about two-thirds of all the new generating capacity installed in the United States came from renewable sources. Uh, so far this year, it's at 99% of all new um, generation has come from, from renewables. Um, that is striking, and it's what the future is going to look like. Um, renewables are competitive. Um, they're growing absolutely, um, extremely quickly. Um, that said, so this is point two, to temper that growth story, um, even if you're growing really fast, if you're starting from a relatively small base, uh, you only kind of slowly uh, take up larger parts of, of market share. Um, and so March of this year, 2016, was the first year that non-hydropower renewables accounted for more than 10% of total generation in the United States, uh, including uh, hydropower. Uh, we came about just about 20% of the nation's um, electricity, the actual generation, not the capacity, uh, came from renewable sources. That is a, a significant milestone, but um, again, when you, when, you go, when you talk about 10% of total generation and you talk about 90% of new growth, uh, it just shows that um, these industries are growing quickly, but we still have a long way to go um, in terms of transforming um, the broader uh, U.S. generating fleet. Um, and for point three, so this is a very kind of sunny story, uh, to make a bad pun about solar. Um, so there's been great growth in solar and wind. And the third point I wanted to make, and I, and I think we'll talk about other renewable technologies uh, during this panel as well, um, is that we haven't seen as dramatic a growth for hydropower, for geothermal. Um, renewables aren't just wind and solar. Um, we love them all, we do them all. Um, some of that is cost reduction. We've seen really tremendous cost reductions in wind and solar. Uh, that's been harder to do for, for geothermal and for hydropower, two technologies that we're, uh, we're very active in. Uh, and I would also just note that because they have longer lead times, uh, you can't do a wind product. You can do a wind product in maybe you know two to three to four years. Geothermal is going to take considerably longer, just by the nature of the of the technology and the regulatory process. That the really stop and go policy story that we've seen um, here in the U.S. on the tax side has been really you know especially problematic for for geothermal and hydropower. And I note that just you know we're telling a very positive story about renewables in the U.S. Um, and we'd like to see those technologies grow as well because um, it's it's good to have uh, a diverse mix. 
um, and they are, they are certainly important, um, and particularly in the western U.S. for, for geothermal. Um, so part of this positive story, uh, and this is something that's both driving the market and reflecting how far we've come, is the new customers who have come in. Um, it used to be on the utility side that every time you saw a new utility purchase renewables, it was really um, you know, a sign, oh wow, this is becoming more mainstream. We're at the point now where the, renewables, where the utilities aren't just buying renewables, uh, contracting for the power. Uh, they're looking to build it themselves. They're looking to own it themselves. I, I think we should take that as a sign of how far uh, the industries have come. Uh, and this also goes for uh, commercial and industrial clients. Um, it also goes for the U.S. government, uh, who was just speaking here for the panel before us. All of these customers are going towards renewables because of um, the, the cost, uh, because you can get a long-term contract for um, stable power supply at a very low price. Um, that's extremely compelling, and again, it reflects how far, um, how far these industries have come. Um, another point, a um, fifth point, is just this is a very dynamic um, uh, industry. There is a huge amount of competition between companies for projects, for contracts to sell to utilities. Um, it is a very intense uh, industry, and that's, again, that's a very good sign. Competition means we're driving down price, uh, the best products are getting built, um, and you know, we should not be surprised that um, at times there's turbulence in the market, that you know, companies fare well, they fare poorly, people take higher risk, lower risk. That's a sign of a really healthy industry, and I think that's something that um, you know, we need to, to remind ourselves about. And as, as somebody who's in the industry, um, it's certainly something we notice. It is, um, it is an intense place to be. Again, that's a good sign. Um, as a sixth point, um, I wanted to just double down on the fact that uh, policy matters. Um, uh, I, I think that when we point to um, where we were in 2008, 2009, to where we are today, a lot of the policies that have been put in place have worked. Uh, renewables are more cost effective. Uh, they've been widely deployed um, by having um, policies in place that's allowed industry to bring down costs. Um, that's a real success story, and policy is going to matter going forward. And so the long-term uh, extensions for wind and solar uh, are you know, certainly welcome. They give the, the industry essentially what they've been asking for, which is uh, long-term visibility, ability to plan, ability to really uh, develop a, a portfolio of projects. Um, that's important. Um, policy is not going to stop mattering. It's going to continue to be, um, to be very... Um, relevant for us, and so I, I, I say that to you know to praise the fact that we're having this expo, um, that we are having the chance to talk to policymakers and kind of showcase as a broad point um, everything that the industry is doing, uh, from efficiency to renewables to, to everyone else. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. And a couple things. I'm so glad that both the Jack and Ruth mentioned that renewables are a host of technologies and resources, and this country is is blessed with an abundance of those, but that's so important to remember. And also that there are so many multiple benefits that we receive from all of these different resources. But while renewables are very important, energy efficiency is huge as well. And the more efficient we get, the further it lets our renewables go. And the, more, the bigger the role that they can play. And one of the most important things that we have is in terms of thinking about how we use that energy. And so I'm so glad that Joseph Eves, with, who is the Director of Government Relations with NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, is here because what manufacturers produce in terms of appliances is absolutely critical. Great. So thank you. And actually, that was a perfect segue. We're going from renewables. I thought I was going to have to make the segue to efficiency. So thank you for doing that for me. So uh, again, uh, <laughs> uh, so again, uh, Joseph Eves with the National Electrical Manufacturer Association. So just to give you a sense of our membership, uh, we have about 400 members across the country uh, in every con uh, in, uh, in every state. Uh, our members basically take the electrons that are produced at at uh, one of Jack's facilities and brings that here. Uh, so the transformers, the wire, the cable, uh, all the way to the lighting uh, that's above us. So our members make all all that product. Uh, and so well, when it comes to energy efficiency, uh, that's a, a big deal for us and a big deal for uh, our members. 
Uh, and those are actually the, the topic of, you know, the big picture that we want to, that I want to speak to real quickly here is I don't have six points, but I have one point, but two examples. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can get through that. So what I want to talk about is uh, energy efficiency. And when it comes to the U.S., that all uh, for the U.S. really started back in 1973 uh, and as part of uh, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. Uh, as a response to the oil crisis, uh, Congress, for the first time, uh, basically developed uh, the first comprehensive energy um, um, program or policy for the U.S. It's the, this is a bill uh, that started the CAFE program, started the Strategic uh, Petroleum Reserve, uh, and also, in importance to what I'm about to talk about, uh, started the energy efficiency programs at DOE. Uh, when it comes to consumer and commercial products. Uh, and so a little bit more about that. That uh, program uh, for NRIs has been really successful. It started off being a program that covered 13 initial products. Uh, it now covers over 60 products. Uh, so it's seen tremendous growth, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing uh, when it comes to this, uh, because it's included more and more. Now I think their stats are around the lines of about 90% of home energy use is uh, touched by a covered product. In commercial applications, I think it's around uh, 50 to 60, and then in industrial, it's around about 30%. Uh, percent. Uh, so uh, the program has its hands in pretty much all aspects of, of the economy when we're talking about energy. Uh, and so for us, it's a big deal. Our, um, out of the 60 or so products that are covered in the program, our members are touched on about 20 to 25 of them, directly about 18, and then our products uh, are also in other products like your refrigerators and things. Just to give you a sense, um, well, one of the examples I'm about to speak to are electric motors. There's, on average, you think electric motors may be in big industrial applications, but there's actually, I think, in average, there's about 30 uh, electric motors in a typical U.S. home. Uh, so those are things that you just don't see every day. Uh, but they're there making your life a little bit easier. Um, and so what our concern in talking about the future of this program, we're really, we want to see it uh, go forward. We want it to be successful. But our concern for the program going forward is that a lot of products are being, uh, are being updated and using more technology, which means they're more connected. Uh, the program really started off being a product, doing regulations around product by product. So you had product A, you had product B, and down the line. Now you have product A, which is in product C, which is talking to product H. And so right now, the way the program is set up, even though it's been through updates throughout the decades, really, uh, there's still the framework isn't in place because Congress has not given them the ability to do some of that work uh, to look to look at the systems-based approach. And that's really for us where we think the next generation of savings is really going to lie, is looking at a uh, systems-based approach when it comes to energy savings. And so I'll give you two examples on that. Uh, first, electric motors. So uh, as many of you probably in this room know, when it comes to industrial energy use, that's about 30% of the entire energy use in the entire country. Uh, of that 30%, 70% of it is driving electric motors that are attached to pumps, fans, uh, your manufacturing processing lines, uh, um, all sorts of equipment uh, in the industrial commercial application. Uh, and so for us, uh, in, in the past, it's been really important for how efficient can we drive electric motors? You know, how, how much efficiency can we get out of that? Uh, but now, uh, for example, uh, you have most electric motors and large electric motors uh, in, in the 90s in terms of efficiency. Uh, so for us, it's about, okay, well, we're in the 90s in a, lot of, in a lot of these cases. Where can we drive more savings for our customers? Well, uh, it's glad we have the water folks on the, on the panel today because an example I want to talk about is actually at a, a water utility. So typically you have, a, uh, in the past, you have an electric motor attached to the pump that pumps the water, and then it's off and on, right? Now, uh, those same processor, that same equipment can now be t uh, uh, connected to go from the electric motor to a controller, a variable speed drive is technically what it's called, and then to the pump. So that kind of extra piece of equipment now allows you to uh, control that, that motor and control that pump. So instead of going at 100%, you're going at 20% or 30%. Everything's still on, but you're able to control and react to the actual demand and need 
Uh, and so that additional control drives additional savings for, in this case, the water utility. So that's reducing costs. That gives them the ability to connect to software and to remote technologies to where they can be in the office or they can be you know, at their home, especially in a, rural, in a rural utility situation where maybe there's four or five people that are uh, running the, the water utility. Uh, it's important for them to have that control and they can also attach it to software so if power is really cheap in the middle of the night in their location they can run their pumps or m do more processes at night. Uh, so for us uh, what we're really looking at is driving more of those uh, efficiency gains when it comes to systems. Uh, we're working with a variety of stakeholders to make it easier for customers to look at all of that equipment and install it and knowing that for their particular application that they'll, um, they'll get the savings that we're driving. The second example uh, that I'll get to real quickly is when it comes to lighting. Uh, as we all know, lighting is going through a tremendous amount of change right now. Uh, LEDs are really the future of that. We've seen that firsthand in our own cells data to where for the first time uh, in the first quarter of 2016, uh, LED in terms of the consumer market made up over 25% of the entire market while everything else has been seeing a decrease. And so just the simple technology switch from incandescent to LEDs is, is driving a huge amount of savings. Uh, DOE's uh, conservative estimates is by 2030, uh, we can save about 265 terawatt hours of energy. So that sounds like a really big number and my boss told me that's really wonky and you need to really change that. And so I converted that to homes and so that's about 19 uh, million homes uh, in the U.S. on a yearly uh, basis. If you go with DOE's uh, aggressive projections for LED lighting, which includes systems, includes controls, which I'll highlight in just a second, you're looking at 395 terawatts of, of energy saved, and that comes to about 36.1 million homes in the U.S. annually. So that's a huge amount of, of savings. Uh, and to really get there, you need, again, look at a systems-based approach. Uh, the LEDs, one of the reasons they're taking off, especially in the commercial space, uh, is that you can connect them to building management software. You can connect them to shade. So if when they redo this side of Canon, maybe they can put some daylighting shades on that window and you can see like, oh, well, we can turn down those lights because there's enough daylight coming in. And again, dimming and, and reducing the overall electricity use that's uh, through the lights. And so I'll just close with that uh, and just say, you know, we're really interested in Gun Ho with lore, working with new technology and pushing and working with our stakeholders and with DOE about how to drive even further efficiency savings out of this out of uh, two legacy products that are ever evolving. Thank right. you. So thanks, because it is a very exciting, forward-moving story. And, um, and so we look forward to hearing more about that. So we're now going to turn to Mark McCall, who is the Executive Director for the, loans, for the Loan Programs Office at the U.S. Department of Energy. And of course, there they are really looking for the sort of the next sort of generation that looking for innovative, clean energy approaches to really push the envelope forward. Thank you, Carol, and thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Mark McCall. I am the Executive Director of the Loan Program Office at the Department of Energy. I'm very pleased to be here to give you an update on, uh, on what we've accomplished and where we're going. <clears throat> and it actually plays right into uh, to a lot of the comments that you've heard from, uh, from the panelists today. So I actually started in this job about a year ago. Uh, I came from the private sector. I had uh, helped start a private equity firm that invested in energy about 17 years ago. So for the last 17 years, I was actually the chief financial officer and the general counsel at an energy-related private equity firm, and that helps inform uh, my view of the challenges and opportunities that are facing us as we try to deploy innovative uh, technology in the energy industry. So starting out with just giving you a, a little bit of background on LPO. What is LPO? So LPO, talking about the importance of policy, uh, LPO was created in 2005 uh, in a bipartisan manner, um, and we managed two separate loan programs. So the first loan program was Title 17, uh, and that was uh, designed to launch innovative clean energy technologies into the market that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have three uh, technology-specific solicitations that we're focused on. One is advanced nuclear, one is advanced fossil technology, and one is renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
um, <clears throat> to qualify for a loan in one of those solicitations, uh, there's, there are a few things. So you have to build your project in the U.S. so that we get the jobs in the U.S. You have to uh, deploy innovative technology and you have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And importantly, there has to be a business plan uh, that includes at least 20% coming from the private sector in terms of total project costs. Uh, and that business plan has to give us a high degree of confidence that the loan is gonna be repaid. So that's Title 17, Clean Energy Finance. Uh, we also run the ATVM, which is Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Program. That was set up in 2007. Uh, and that was designed to uh, support American auto manufacturers and help them meet the uh, increasing mileage standards and also support American uh, manufacturing. So one question is why were these programs established? And I think importantly Congress recognized that there is a gap in the marketplace when it comes to financing innovative technology and particularly at that moment when you're scaling it up. So, uh, commercial lenders and bondholders are typically not willing to take the risk of scale up with a new technology. That's what LPO is designed to do and that is where we tend to, uh, to play. And it's actually very important because we were talking about the, the fact that these, uh, these new technologies have started from a small base but they're now growing and gaining in significance and very important to that is reducing the cost. And so um, one of the places that we've been very successful is in utility scale solar PV. So, in 2010, there were actually no uh, utility-scale solar PV projects in the U.S. LPO financed the first five uh, for about $4.5 billion. And over a five- or six-year time period, costs have come down more than 60%, and that has allowed the private sector to essentially drive forward with that business. It's become a big business in the U.S. There have been at least 28 new projects that have been financed for utility-scale solar PV uh, without our involvement since that time. And so now we are looking to do that same thing with other technologies. So by definition, anything that we've financed in the past, uh, we're, we're probably not going to be able to finance in the future because it's no longer innovative. So we're actually looking for the next new innovative technologies to finance. So just to give you a sense of the success of the program, uh, we judge ourselves on three, three factors. So one is deploying innovation, one is reducing carbon emissions, and one is our financial performance. So just to run through, uh, you know, starting with deploying uh, innovation, I'm just going to run you through kind of the highlights of our existing portfolio. It's a $30 billion portfolio. Um, we financed the first new nuclear reactors in the U.S. in 30 years. That's Plant Vogel in Georgia. We financed five of the first uh, solar PV facilities in the U.S. We financed five of the largest concentrating solar, including two, uh, with storage, which is very significant. We financed uh, one of the world's largest wind farms in Oregon three geothermal facilities in the western United States. And our auto program uh, financed Tesla to build, the, uh, or build out the uh, Fremont facility where they're, they're building the Teslas. So helped to bring the first zero, uh, zero emissions full-scale uh, automobile to market. We also financed Ford uh, to retrofit 13 different facilities um, where they're building the EcoBoost engines, which is a much more efficient um, engine. And we helped uh, finance Nissan to actually onshore jobs. So they, brought, they built from scratch a, uh, an advanced battery manufacturing facility in Smyrna, Tennessee, and added an assembly line uh, there to an existing facility uh, to produce the Nissan LEAF. And importantly, none of these projects that I've talked about uh, I think would exist today if Congress hadn't uh, put in place the LPO and provided the financing to, to back these projects. Um, the, other, the, the second way that we uh, evaluate our success is reducing carbon emissions. So once all of the projects are operating at capacity, uh, the portfolio is expected to avoid over 19 million metric tons of CO2 each year. And we just released this update today, but um, as of April, LPO's portfolio had prevented 30 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions, which is the equivalent of 6.2 million cars off the road. The other way we, we judge, our financial, or judge our performance is based on our financial performance. And, um, you know, importantly, it's, it's tough to kind of judge apples to apples, but um, at this point, 98% of the money of the funds that have been lo loaned out are expected to be repaid. That gives us about a 2% loss ratio. And if you think about that and compare it to the private sector, that's actually a very, very um, um, impressive metric. And particularly when you take into account the fact that this program is financing technology and scaling it up, and that most of the money went out during the, the heart of the fiscal crisis. So if you compare that loss ratio to any major bank during that time period, it will stand up and perform very well. 
And there's no accident. I mean, that's not an accident that we're performing well. We actually do a lot of things to protect the taxpayer interest in terms of rigorous due diligence, the way we structure the deals, and the way we monitor them. So uh, moving forward, uh, we're looking to do more of the same. So we still have about $40 billion in remaining loan authority. Uh, that's $16 billion for the, uh, for the Advanced Technology Vehicles Manufacturing Program, $12 billion for Advanced Nuclear, $8 billion for Advanced Fossil Energy, and $4.5 billion for Renewable and Energy Efficiency. And last summer at Senator Reid's Clean Energy Summit, President Obama announced guidance for our distributed energy projects under the fossil and renewable solicitation. So we're working on distributed energy as well now. So um, by any measure, whether it's deploying innovation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, or on our financial performance, LPO has been a tremendous success. And you know, we're continuing that with, with more than $40 billion of loan authority remaining. And, and you know, why is that important? Well, I think it's become consensus that innovative energy is going to be an economic driver going forward. And it's very important that the U.S. lead on that and not cede our place to others. Um, and you're seeing other countries that are ramping up their investment, and we need, to, we need to build on the successes that we've had so that we get the good jobs, that we build the enduring companies of the future. We have the IP here. Um, and LPO has shown, I think, that we can select the projects, get them built, um, get them constructed, get them operating, and see the taxpayer uh, paid back. So it's been an important success in, in the policy arena in terms of driving forward uh, the things that my colleagues have spoken about. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So for looking at another sector, uh, we're going to turn to Andy Kuntz, who is the president and CEO of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association, um, a whole area that I think doesn't get nearly enough attention. Andy? Thank you. And thank you for uh, having me here. Um, it, it is interesting that Transportation is probably one of the biggest users of energy, and most of the things we're hearing here today is about uh, electrical generation and less about transportation energy, which is a liquid fuel situation. And we really face a, a coming crisis that we're not going to have enough liquid fuels to power all of our transportation. Right now, something like 98% of all the transportation in the world is powered by liquid fuels. The only ones that are not are electric rail systems, which can then be powered by any number of sources as you scale up renewable energy. So well, we, we launched the U.S. High Speed Rail Association in 2009, and we put out this map uh, as a vision for the country. It shows 17,000 miles. Uh, my assistant, Kelsey, actually just passed these around, anyone who uh, wants to see it. Um, and what this shows is, is that it's a vision for the country for the next 30 years or so to build out a complete new high-speed rail system, 100% powered by renewable energy. And so we're, we're showing it built in phases. We started with some of the busier corridors to start there and scale up as we go across the country. And what this can do, once this is fully built out, this can literally reduce our oil consumption as a nation by up to like 70 or 80%. Um, because most of it, again, is we're, we're extremely inefficient. We talked about efficiency a minute ago. Our most inefficient thing that we do in this country is our transportation system, and mainly with a single occupant in a large SUV is about as inefficient as you can possibly get to, for a transportation mode. So the idea is that um, building high-speed rail is, lays the groundwork for a new transportation system for the future, and the second uh, initiative that we started goes right with it is transit-oriented development, and we started the Transit-Oriented Development Institute to promote uh, compact, walkable, mixed-use development at the rail stations. So when you combine those two, a walkable, mixed-use community where you can get to your many of your daily needs by walking or bicycle or riding a train, you combine that with an extensive rail system, you can literally almost take the energy, need, energy use out of the system completely. You can replace cars not needed in many cases. Um, and, and there's many countries around the world that have proven this. The high-speed rail has been in existence for over 50 years, starting in Japan. Uh, they went big with it in Europe uh, about 30 years ago, all over France. And now it's literally uh, China just built like 10,000 miles of all brand new high-speed rail in about seven or eight years, and their country is now extremely efficient. They have, they, the China's high-speed rail system has reduced 
the global um, pressure on energy supplies, just their own system alone, because they're such a big nation and have so many people. So well, we're, we're promoting this as a way to really kind of build a 21st century uh, economy, a 21st century transportation system with 21st century living options for people to live in walkable communities and not have to be forced into using a tremendous amount of energy just to live their daily life or just to run a simple errand. You have to move a 3,000 pound vehicle just to go get a gallon of milk. It does, it's not really very smart or efficient. So anyway, that's what we're doing. We have a conference coming up September here in DC, Transit Oriented Development Conference. It will focus on rail, real estate, and lifestyle, and kind of the intersection of the three, and how when you put the three together, you really do get an enormous energy saving. So with that, thank you. And if you have any questions, we do have a booth in the other room to come and talk to us. Great, thanks so much, Andy. And we've also heard other people talk about water today and how critically important it is. So we are now going to hear from Thomas Horner, who is the Vice President for Water Management. Thank you, Carol, and I'm going to stand up. I have a habit of uh, speaking a little better. I think what we're really here today and what this conference and this panel is about, we're here to talk about the commons and what really that means to us. The concept of the commons started in small communities in Europe that it was what's the most fair way to divide our joint resources. What can the government do? What can, so the commons has evolved from a lot of experts' points of view to, it's the air we breathe, it's the water we use, it's the energy we consume, but it's every single part of the federal, state, and local governments they're owned by us. It's part of the common interest to do what's right. And you've got an incredible amount of smart people that are still working in silos that in the past never really talked to each other. Uh, one of the advantages I have being a water nut growing up around a lot of energy people is I'm at conferences for the last 30 five years and I've gotten to know some good friends in the area and so some of the gurus I remember asking one this year so what do you see in the next 15 to 20 years where is the energy in the renewable field going to be and he just cracked up laughing and he looked at his iPhone and he said this isn't even 10 years old yet we forget that we did not have an interconnected world 10 years ago. The transfer of technology, the transfer of ideas is at a lightning speed compared to what it was. And so the sustainability, the reliability, the efficiency fields, they're all going to grow exponentially for the next five to ten years. It's a trend that can't be stopped. And so what was interesting, a few of the experts, I asked, what are going to be some of the real crises and the real problems? Probably one of the biggest problems we'll see in five to seven years is the grid and when I talk about the grid I'm not just talking about electricity I'm talking about natural gas I'm talking about water and sewer the four essential services we need to survive there's a possibility that with the megawatts watts and the conservation movement coupled with how incredibly the cost reduction in all of the renewables that 25 to 50 percent of the commercial industrial and residential consumers within five to seven years 
will have no need for the grid. They will be able to generate on site all the power they need. When you get 25% of people, and at least what the experts are telling me anyway, is 50 to 75% of new construction five years from now will be capable of net zero on-site production. The problem is the grid, and if they do not have the ability to cost effectively store and deliver electricity, they will become non-relevant 20 years from now. The problem of looking off 20 years in the future is when the guru chuckled at me, he was, you have, that's science fiction. 20 years away. Well, it was 20 years before that Star Trek was using their communicators. And the nine-year-olds were watching that and saying, wow, that's really cool. I want one of those. Well, the stuff you see in science fiction today is going to be common in 20 years. I don't know how. So the conservation movement we talked about Water is the lowest of the hanging fruit, but we're seeing it in controls, we're seeing it in lighting, we're seeing it in every field, that 30% reduction in water, electricity, is not uncommon for a building that's only 10 years old. We're getting much more efficient from the 70s on, and the biggest blowback from it seems some of the electrical providers are not being fair to their customers on their interconnection fees and on the rates that they're paying for the electricity that's generated what they're doing by those policies is pushing the consumer to go off grid the more people that go off grid it'll snowball and make the grid for millennials and Generation Z as relevant to them is the phone that is on my kitchen wall. My children never use a home phone. There's a good chance that if the grid doesn't take care of transporting and storing electricity, it won't be around 25 years from now. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And th thanks to all of our panel. Absolutely.